dairy cows, and mammals, who, like humans, only produce milk to feed their children. And so what this means is that every single year, year in, year out, farmers will forcibly impregnate the dairy cows to ensure that they're continuously producing a profitable supply of milk. And so the farmer restrains the dairy cow and forces semen inside of her cervix. To tell you about the next part of dairy farming, I want to tell you about a personal experience I had, something that happened to me back in 2017. It was the first time I'd ever visited a dairy farm. And so myself and several others, we kind of just wandered into the farm with the objective of filming, taking pictures, and raising awareness and trying to show people what happens in the dairy industry. Now, the farmer, he saw us, and he wasn't particularly bothered by our presence. And so he allowed us to wander around. And as we were wandering around, we came across a pen. And in this pen was a mother cow and her baby. And her baby had just been born. In fact, her baby was still so newborn, the mother was cleaning her after the birth. And so the farmer came over to us. And he told us he was going to separate the baby from their mother. Now, all dairy calves are taken away from their mothers normally within the first 24 hours of life so the farmer can take as much milk as possible and make as much money from the dairy cow's body as they possibly can. And so we filmed. We filmed as the farmer brought in the trolley and he put the trolley next to the calf. He picked the calf up and he threw the calf into the trolley and then began to wheel the calf away. I ended up stood next to the mother and I walked alongside her for as far as we could because then the farmer closed the gate on both of us. And so I looked at that mother, and I watched her, as she watched her baby being taken further, and further, and further, and further, and further, and further, and further away from her. And that was the last time she ever saw her child. And so as I was looking at this dairy cow, this mother, she looked at me. And in that moment, our eyes made contact. And I saw everything I expected to see. I saw pain, I saw fear, I saw anguish. But I saw something else. I saw confusion. And this is what hurt me the most. Because I realized in that moment that the animals have no comprehension of why we do these things to them. They don't understand. They don't know. And I thought about all the, the pigs in the gas chambers. And all the animals are exploited in all the very insidious industries of animal exploitation. And I thought about the fact that they had no idea why any of these things were being performed and done to them. And I thought about all the times I'd been most scared in my life. And how often fear was coupled with confusion, an ambiguity about the situation, a lack of comprehension about why these things were happening and when they were going to stop. And I thought about how confusion often amplifies the experience of terror and the experience of fear. But of course, we can't explain these things to animals. They don't speak our language, and nor do we speak theirs. What if we could? What if we could communicate with them, and talk to them, and have a dialogue with them, and tell them why we're doing these things to them? What would we say? What would you say? What would you say to that dairy cow in that moment as her baby has been taken away from her? Would you say, I know that you're grieving, and I know the loss of your child will cause you pain, and that you wish to act out your maternal drive to be a mother and to raise your baby. But what you've got to understand is that I love the taste of your lactations in my cup of coffee, and congealed into a block called cheese that I grate on my pasta. Do we say, I know you don't want to be forcibly impregnated. I know that's a horrible experience for you, but it's quite inconvenient for me to buy oat milk. What would we say to the pigs in the gas chambers? Would we say, I hear you screaming, and I can see you thrashing, and I acknowledge that you're suffering, but please, can you just understand that I love the taste of your flesh in between two pieces of bread that I call a sandwich? Would we say to the animals, I know you have a desire to life, and that you do not wish to be exploited, but going vegan is a bit extreme. And anyway, this is my personal choice, so can you please respect that? Because really, what else could we say to them? What else could we say to them? We couldn't say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. God, I am so sorry. 
But what you have to understand is this is a necessity, and this has to be done. And I wish it didn't, but it absolutely does for my survival and the survival of my species. Because that's not true. And that would be a lie. We do not do these things to animals because we have to. We do them because we want to. Or more importantly, because we enjoy the product that comes as a consequence of the things that we do to animals. We do it because we enjoy the taste of their flesh and their secretions. But in reality, our body needs cow flesh, or chicken flesh, lamb flesh or pig flesh as much as it needs Labrador flesh or poodle flesh or cat flesh. Our body needs cow's milk as much as it needs dolphin milk or giraffe milk or rat milk. It just doesn't. And so the question then becomes, well, what has higher value, taste or life? our taste buds, or the life of an animal? Do we really value the 15 minutes of sensory pleasure that we get from consuming their bodies as being worth more than their entire existence? And can we really justify what we do to animals by saying it's our personal choice? And should someone's choice automatically be respected simply because they've personally chosen to enact that choice? I mean, every choice that we make is a personal choice regardless of whether that choice would be deemed moral or immoral. And when we cite personal choice as a justifier for what we do to animals, whose choice are we considering other than our own? Do we factor in the choice of the trillions of animals, and it is trillions, the trillions of animals who are killed every single year, do we factor in their desire for life and their desire to live without exploitation and suffering? Or do we unconsciously buy these products simply because we always have? and because our peers around us do so, and because society tells us it's okay. But how do we morally justify this? What moral justification do we have to excuse the exploitation of animals? And so I wanna go back to the dairy industry for just a moment, because in the UK, a survey was conducted by the British Cattle Veterinary Association. And the survey revealed that about 150,000 cows are sent to the slaughterhouse each year whilst pregnant. And it revealed about 40,000 of these cows are in the late stages of pregnancy, theoretically meaning that the baby inside of them could be capable of independent life. Now, there are no legal guidelines to protect unborn animals within the industry, but the RSPCA, which is Britain's leading welfare organization, has a set of guidelines that it advises that a slaughterhouse should follow in the event of a pregnant cow being brought to their facility. And so those guidelines state that the cow should be killed in the normal way. So a bolt in the head and a knife across their throat. But they're supposed to hang on the bleeding line for at least five minutes to try and provide enough time for the baby inside of the mother to die as well. Now an ex-vet who used to work in UK abattoirs had this to say about her experience of seeing pregnant cows being slaughtered. She said, sometimes when the animals are hanging on the bleeding line, you can see their unborn calves kicking inside their mother's wombs. I, as a vet, am not expected to do anything. Unborn animals don't exist according to the regulations. I'm supposed to stand there, do nothing, stay quiet. It broke my heart. I felt like a criminal. But the survey from the British Cattle Veterinary Association went on to reveal that over 75% of the pregnant cows sent to slaughter were sent by farmers who didn't think the cows were pregnant or simply did not know. Which means that around three quarters of the pregnant cows are sent to the slaughterhouse without the slaughterhouse being made prior aware that they're pregnant. And so the cow comes into the, the stun box. The bolt goes against her head. She's hung on the bleeding line and her throat is cut. But then she's not left there for a minimum of five minutes. She's taken to the next phase of the slaughter, which is when she's cut open. But because the baby inside takes longer to die, what can happen is the mother can be cut open and the baby can fall out, alive, conscious, sentient, gasping for air and breathing. And now the RSPCA which stands for the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, states that if you cut out a baby from their dead mother and that baby is alive, 
You shoot them with a bolt, or you hit them over the head with a blunt instrument. Their first and last experiences of life are on the floor of a slaughterhouse. Now, we've all been raised with a set of values dictated to us by the cultures that we were raised in, values passed down to us by the families who brought us up, and values that we assign to ourselves for all of those cognitive biases that exist within us all. But society has always progressed precisely because it dared to challenge these dominant paradigms. The stagnation of progress comes from the refusal to challenge what it is that we have always done. But as Aristotle once said, the roots of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. We can no longer bury our heads in the sand. It is time to take our heads out of the sand and no longer ignore something, the objectivity of something, simply because it makes us feel uncomfortable or contradicts the values and lifestyles that we have always adopted. And so I left that farm, that dairy farm, and I left that mother there. And I left her newborn baby in the solitary confinement pen that the farmer had thrown them into. I left, but they did not. Their life and their fate had been decided for them before they were even conceived. And so when I went back to my life, which was a life where I could do what I want, spend time with my friends, spend time with my family, do things that made me happy and fundamentally live a life that was not dictated for me, I made a vow to myself. And I vowed that I would never again allow the suffering of animals to fall far from my mind. And I would certainly never again claim that their suffering does not exist. Because even if we refuse it with our thoughts, with our eyes, and with our ears, the suffering that animals are forced to endure is an objective reality that exists even if we claim that it does not. Can we honestly still cling on to the idea that what happens to animals is isolated and a rarity? Or is it time for us to acknowledge that the abuse and suffering that we inflict upon animals is systematic and ubiquitous and exists because of the purchases that we make and therefore the blood is on our hands, collectively as a species, but also as individuals as well. One of the defining characteristics of our species is our ability to evolve and adapt, to learn from our mistakes, and then change accordingly. Morality has always changed. And so, as our understanding and knowledge about the complexity and wonder of life continues to change, so too should our tolerance our attitude and our empathy towards those non-human animals who exist on this planet with us and not for us. In our authoritarian ways, we arbitrarily point the finger and decide that certain species of animals deserve different fates to other species of animals. For those cows in that farm, and indeed for every animal that exists on every farm around the world, it is a life of exploitation and then death in a slaughterhouse. And yet for other animals who are identical in every single way that matters, it's a life of love and companionship in our homes and in our families. And so, of course, as humans, we are very different to the other beings on this planet. But what we share in common is what is paramount. We are all alive. We are conscious. We are sentient. Our experience of life is shown to us by the subjective and individualistic perceptions that we see through the life that we all live. Intrinsically, we all want to live a life free from exploitation, from suffering and from harm. A life of peace, of tranquility and of happiness. And so is it time for us to consider all animals in our circle of moral consideration? to understand that it's not the way that we exploit them that matters, but the fact that we exploit them in the first place, the mentality that allows us to exploit them in the first place. Is it time for us to make a change? Is it time for us to go vegan for ourselves, for our own health, for our planet, but also for them? 
the other beings who may not walk like us, talk like us, or look like us, but who definitely deserve a life of freedom just like us. Thank you so much for listening.